This market is laughing in the face of the hawkish Fed talk. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. Another rally on our hands. We inch higher by about two tenths of 1% on the S&P. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. Live from New York, we begin with the big issue, climbing the wall of doubt. With the rally that we've seen so far. The big question is, okay, now what? Well, we don't know. Possibly going through a bear market rally, possibly starting a very real new bull market rally. But right now, it's all about earnings. Earnings are cranking away. We're making our way through earnings season. This season so far has been, again, one more you know, really pretty good season. A relatively solid earnings season. Yeah, you're going to start seeing equities get supported. But the problems are still with us. We may or may not be in a recession. A lot of data is still out there. Core have line, CPI, PC, whatever. It's all some huge number. We're still expecting the Fed to raise rates. Investors don't know exactly how this script is going to play out. A lot of answers we still need. Joining us now is Robert Banks, Jane Foley, Troy Gajewski of FS Investments. Jane, first to you. The Fed was comfortable with choppy June markets. Does it hate markets in July and August? <laughs> Oh, well, you know, I think some of the economic data has been a bit better from the U.S. Uh, recently, or certainly if you look at yesterday's uh, numbers. And, of course, those earnings seasons are, are higher, too. But, you know, the fundamentals remain the same, that the Federal Reserve, uh, the commentary that we've had this week suggests that the Fed is going to be still pretty aggressive in terms of getting inflation down, acting on, on policy, trying to get those inflation expectations down uh, to stop those second-order inflation effects. So I think the um, I think the equity market rallies are still quite brave in this environment. I still think there's an awful lot of negative news uh, still to come uh, from, from interest rates, uh, particularly. The performance off the June lows, Troy Gajewski, has been phenomenal, up almost 20% from the lows of June on the Nasdaq 100, up around about 13% on the S&P. Consumer discretionary, I keep going back to that, it's up about 25% from the June low. Troy, I'll ask the same question to you. Why are market stocks laughing in the face of this Fed speak of the last week? Well, look, bottom line, sentiment was very negative in June for, for very good reasons, not only a slowing economy that with recession risk going up substantially, but also a Federal Reserve that, as you know, is going to tighten aggressively, already has started that. Um, but you know, bear market rallies are classic uh, attributes of bear markets. When you look back at history, you know, you typically had the strongest rally in bear markets where you get marginally less bad news. In this case, it was, you know, markets really grasping at the new concept of neutral, being close to neutral in the last uh, Fed uh, announcement by Powell or, or, you know, discussion afterwards. Uh, but the reality is, is, you know, markets are laughing at the Fed right now. And the Fed has a tough job because they have to tighten financial conditions. When we look forward, you know, we're hopeful that CPI can get to 7% by the end of the year, maybe a smidge lower. That's obviously unacceptable. The looser financial conditions are, the more it steals the resolve of the Fed to tighten even more aggressively. And John, maybe, just maybe, the month of August, they'll actually hit their QT target finally and start getting more aggressive with the balance sheet drainage. Yeah, I've had a lot of questions about that privately behind the scenes as to what is actually happening with that balance sheet. Jane, for a central bank that doesn't want to offer forward guidance, they've offered a lot of forward guidance over the last 24 hours, haven't they? It would certainly seem that way. And it's quite interesting because the lack of uh, forward guidance seems to be the, the topic that several central banks are going down. You could accuse the RBA, certainly the ECB, of, of not wanting to, to produce forward guidance in the same way, making uh, policies uh, data-driven. But certainly, if we look at the Federal Reserve commentary from the start of the week, it has been hawkish and there has been uh, a fairly uh, large amount of candid outlooks from some of these uh, federal uh, bank uh, members. And what are the markets taken away from that? Well, uh, they've taken away from the fact that from that, the fact that 75 basis points could still be coming again, maybe in, in September. It, it's not totally uh, out of uh, uh, out of vision for, for that. So, uh, you know, markets, I think, uh, you know, are preparing, certainly in, in, the, in the bond market, for uh, maybe more in, in terms of interest rate hikes. And I think equity investors, uh, you know, need to keep an eye on that. Equity investors confronting right now a wall of doubt and climbing over it with ease. Mm -hmm. Every single note I read is saying the same thing 
at the moment. Here's the note from Goldman and Goldman Sachs' Cecilia Mariotti. She says, without clear signs of a positive shift in macro momentum, temporary re-risking could actually increase risks of another leg lower in the market rather than signal the end of the bear market. Over at HSBC, Max Kettner wrote this, for this buy anything rally to continue, we need to see further repricing of rate hike expectations and another sharp drop in real yields. But market pricing of risk assets is now very much out of line with our cyclical growth indicators. Barclays joins the party. The emerging Goldilocks narrative for equities is that bad data and peak inflation will prompt more dovish central banks. We are skeptical and would fade the rally with bearish sentiment positioning can extend the short squeeze. Troy, what if the bulls are right? Can we just consider that for a moment? What if Marco Kalanovic over at JP Morgan is just right, that the peak story is in and from here it's about recovery for this equity market? Well, I hope he would be right now instead of coming into the year when he was wildly bullish. But um, look, there, there's always a non-zero probability that the fundamentals are, are all the fundamental analysis is wrong, right? When we look for the only thing we can think of, and there's very few, is that remember nominal GDP is growing much, much faster than real GDP. Revenue comes in nominal GDP. Margins are compressing. But are they going to compress fast enough into a slower economy to lead to meaningfully lower earnings? We think we have the answer in a recession. Obviously, earnings are going down. The question is to what degree. But if the Fed can thread the needle and nominal GDP dwarfs real GDP enough and margins don't compress substantially, that could, in fact, mean we hit at least a local bottom in June. But it's still highly, highly unlikely we've hit the bottom of this incredible uh, a bear market that's primarily driven by exceptional inflation and very aggressive Fed tightening and now, unfortunately, a much, much weaker economic environment. And we've got an easing of financial conditions over the last month in a material way, not just the equity market, but credit spreads in high yield have tightened about 140 basis points in a single month. In the same month, they we're all discussing more rate hikes and potentially a recession in America. Go figure. Futures right now fade a little bit. They're positive by almost a tenth on the S&P, up by a little more on the Nasdaq. Let's get to Taylor Riggs for a little bit more on this market <laughs> jittery phase for the investor base. Hey, Taylor. And some easing of those financial conditions, John. So when you take a look at the last few weeks and the rebound that we've had within the equity market as well, despite, as you also mentioned, a huge lift up back up in yields earlier this week, again, sort of a 20 base point move and then a little bit of an additional lift yesterday at least on the front end of the curve so in the last few weeks you've had some significant gains in terms of equities higher and bond yields trying to find their footing uh, here within a 10-year yield when you think about the bottom, John, and I love that you were talking about some of the bullish notes out there, is how much of this relates to sort of the bottom line and coming out of earnings season? There was a great note out this morning that we're still 6 to 7% higher in terms of earnings per share than we were at the January high. So a lot of people are saying that we still have a lot more room to run. This is actually more just a big bear market rally. Because in previous recessions, you really need to start to see those earnings per share really start to come down. And we are nowhere near there. When we think about some of the positioning, look at the terminal chart. I think it was interesting. The AAII survey had sort of signaled this as well. You're a little bit higher on the week, but still looking at 18 straight weeks of sort of the bearish positioning. And this highlights this here as well, right? Sort of how we're thinking about um, sort of our outlook here. Some of the bearish levels that we haven't seen now actually going back since 2016. John. Taylor, thank you. I want to come to you, Jane, just on some of the economic data away from some of the market stuff. Yesterday, S&P Global had a PMI for services. It was terrible. We ignored that. We focused on ISM services, which was great. Why is that, Jane? Sometimes the market sees what it wants to see, and then certainly uh, if the market was uh, you know, in, in the appetite for, for buying a little bit of risk, then it would have probably focused on that. But ultimately, I think uh, uh, the data will come out in the wash. You know, Everything that, was, that, that is in there will eventually uh, uh, run through. And, and I think, uh, generally speaking, if we step back, you know, the market is looking ahead to, to slower growth for the U.S. Uh, into next year. And, of course, uh, weaker growth globally as well, you know, from, from China, from, from the Eurozone, and certainly, of course, uh, from, from the U.K. So, uh, you know, this this is not uh, an infrequent thing to happen, the market focusing on, on what it wants to see. But uh, again, it, it's part of perhaps a short term um, uh, outlook rather than, you know, looking in the, in the, in the big picture. Jenny, are you expecting that ISM to come down to where that S&P Global PMI ultimately is? Is that how that gap closes from your standpoint? 
Yeah, you know, that eventually does happen. I mean, you know, we can see that in lots of uh, bigger surveys. If, if you look, for instance, in, um, you know, the, the various measures of, of labour, um, eventually when we stand back, we wait for all the revisions to come through, then they generally tell the same sort of story. Um, and, and I think uh, given that the Fed has been hiking, given the strength of the US dollar, given the early signs that we've seen of labour market loosening and, and various different uh, indicators, uh, I, I think that's exactly what will happen. Troy, no real sign of a Fed pivot. The data is weaker. I'll catch up with Mike McKee in about five minutes' time. We'll talk about jobless claims. They're heading in the wrong direction. I've asked a few guests this question, Troy. I'll ask it of you. What business do high yield spreads have tightening 140 basis points in a single month? Yeah, unfortunately, very little diff, uh, business unless we can avoid a recession. If the Fed can thread the needle, uh, perhaps we've seen the wides and spreads this cycle. Although, again, if you look at what the Fed is uh, forecasting for balance sheet drainage, it's four and a half times the pace of the last QT, 3.6 times in terms of nominal GDP, and 2.9 times in terms of existing money supply. So that alone, we think, should drive wider wides and high yield. Uh, but clearly, the tightening back to your positioning discussions before, just alongside equities, uh, we had extreme bearish sentiment. There hasn't been a lot of new supply, which over the medium to long term is obviously tough for the economy, but it means you could set up for a bear market rally there. Um, and John, you know what happens in recessions. You know, high yield goes to 1,000 to 1,200 over. It obviously got meaningfully wider in the GFC and the pandemic, but no one's calling for that. Uh, so in a recessionary outcome, clearly high yield spreads are going wider. Well, the Bank of England is forecasting a big recession over in the UK. Starts Q4 and goes through the whole of 2023. Jane, first question I asked myself when I saw these forecasts from the BOE this morning. 13% inflation, recession from Q4 this year through next year. Can you imagine the Fed forecasting the same thing, Jane? What did you make of that? No, this... It's incredibly candid uh, from, from the Bank of England, incredibly candid uh, language uh, that we don't generally get. Sometimes you get this uh, candid language from, from the, 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 the Riggs Bank, sometimes from uh, the Aussie or, or the RBNZ, but generally not from, from the, the Bank of England. Um, it is very worrying to, to see the data that they're, they're, they're talking about, a 13 per cent print of in, on inflation by the end of the year and then several quarters of, of recession. Um, for many UK economists or many UK watchers, though, it's not an enormous a surprise. Uh, there's been a lot of very gloomy indicators already from the UK, and I think one thing's for certain is that the UK is sort of further into the growth slowdown phase of the economic recovery than other G10 nations. We've had for a while, you know, the, the forecast from the OECD that the, the, the UK economy will perform the worst in the G20 bar Russia. Um, no growth at all. It's forecasting for next year. So but a lot of the gloominess is in the price, but it's still quite startling uh, to see these uh, to see this sort of language from the Bank of England today. I've heard some people say they're just being more upfront and honest about what they think is going to happen in the future. Jane Foley, Troy Gajewski, they're going to be sticking with us. I want to get you some movers ahead of the opening bell. Future slightly positive. Here's Abby with more. Hey, Abby. Hey, John. Well, those futures are slightly positive, ever so slightly, but we've got bigger movers beneath the surface. Starting out with the shares of Cigna, they are popping sharply higher this after the insurance company put up a better second quarter than expected. They also raised the 2022 operating profit outlook as non-emergency medical procedures. They're not as happening as much, so it brings down the company's expenses. ConocoPhillips up 2.4 percent, a better second quarter, similar to Chevron and Exxon, and despite guidance for higher costs, they are boosting buybacks and offering a higher dividend. Investors liking it. On the downside, though, Lucid Group, the luxury car maker, plunging down more than 12 percent as it halves its EV production targets for a second time this year to six to 7,000 vehicles uh, created, produced this year from the original of 20,000. Somewhat related, just crossing the tape now, Nikola, uh, they put up a better quarter than expected. That stock popping by 5 percent. And then Toyota down 3 percent. They are sinking. That stock is sinking, John, after the company said it is sticking with what is considered to be its conservative profit outlook. Abby, thank you. In the commodity market, we've got a break at 90, 89 and 92 on WTI. We're down eight tenths of one percent. That's a break below $90 a barrel on WTI for the first time since the invasion of Ukraine. Crude breaking down on Brent. We're down one percent to 95.75. Coming up, Fed officials doubling down on their pledge to curb inflation. Whether we are technically in a recession right now or not, it uh, doesn't change my analysis. I'm focused on inflation. A lot of forward guidance from a central bank telling you they're not going to provide forward guidance. That conversation, I'm next.
we are uh, laser focused on getting inflation down. And um, you know whether we are technically in a recession right now or not, uh, it doesn't change my analysis. I'm focused on inflation and where inflation is likely going. And that is going to be, that to me is what we have, my opinion is what we have to focus on right now. That was Neil Kashkari, the Fed president over at Minneapolis, just one of the many central bankers over at the Fed, pushing back against the policy pivot this week, focusing on inflation even at the risk of recession with less than 24 hours until the payrolls report here in America. Let's get to Mike McKee for more. Hey, Mike. Hi, John. Uh, you know, there's an old saying, don't fight the Fed. Is anybody listening to what the Fed is saying these days? You take a look at the bond market and you see what's happening with 10-year yields. They've gone down and that pulls down the blue line, which is the financial conditions index. So as the Fed tightens, we're seeing conditions get looser and they're way below the yellow line there, is, which is where the Fed says its base rate is going to be at the end of next year. So what's going to influence the markets well we have a jobs report tomorrow that people are talking about and it is supposed to slow to 250,000 will people take that as bad news the five years before the pandemic the average on a monthly basis was 193,000 unemployment averaged 4.4 percent we're at 3.6 percent now so there's some room to give where the fed could bring it in for a soft landing but right now the markets are not believing that take a look at this number here uh this is Claims and uh, this is uh, jobless, uh, the jobs number, job creation number, and the claims, uh, the CPI number rather, and the forecasts for both. And you can see that we are expecting inflation to go down, but jobs to stay steady, which is also good news for the Fed, but does not tell you why the market is doing what it's doing and pricing in a recession still. Mike, I'm going to squeeze this in. People throw this question around a lot, so forgive me for throwing it around this morning. Is the Fed losing control a bit here? Uh, yeah, uh, the, let's say the reins have loosened a little bit. The question is, do they come back? And that'll depend, uh, as you say, on Fed speak, especially Jay Powell at the end of August. Mike McKee, thank you. Payrolls tomorrow, then on to CPI next week. Two big data points for you over the next week. Right now, futures negative a tenth of 1%. Then the question we're all trying to answer, is it too early for the labour market weakness to show up from the weakness elsewhere? Do we see the weakness elsewhere bleed into the labour market? Do we see that as soon as tomorrow? Matt Lazzetti at Deutsche Bank says this, I do think there's a potential for labour hoarding. That could mean that we don't see the effects in the labour market take place for a longer period of time. The view from Deutsche Bank there. Jane Foley, can I put that question to you? Do you expect the recent weakness we're seeing elsewhere to bleed into the labour market anytime soon? Well, because we all know that uh, the labour market is a lagged indicator, hoarding is, is, is one reason. And also, if we look back, uh, you know, for years, not just because of the pandemic, we've seen uh, the, uh, the, the amount of people in the labour force in the US has, has really dropped away. So that's another reason why firms might want to hoard. They might think, well, you know, it took us ages to, to get back up to speed after the pandemic. We don't really want to uh, allow these uh, workers to, to go too easily. So, yes, there, there is good reasons why economists see the, uh, the, the labour market as, as, as being lagged. That that said, you know, if we look at initial claims already, there, there is a little bit of a sign of, of loosening. If we look at the household survey, if we look at some of the indicators within the ISM survey, we can see a little bit of loosening in the labour market coming through. So I think we will see some, but perhaps, you know, it, it's still going to be a, a pretty firm labour market overall in, in the next few months. And Troy, what do you reckon? Yeah, well, look, the, uh, clearly the labour market's starting to soften. The good news is, though, it started in a white hot a zone and has drifted to red hot and now arguably to hot. Um, and, and that's the main reason we haven't had worse economic outcomes so far, right? I mean, you look at every component to GDP was negative in the first half. You look over at Europe, Europe's obviously a disaster, China's a mess. The U.S. consumer has single-handedly been, been keeping the global economy afloat. Unfortunately, if you extrapolate the recent labor trends forward, um, it, and we get 200 basis points more of unemployment from where we were recently, you know, it's almost impossible to figure out how we don't have at least a mild recession. And, you know, every data series we look at, particularly with holding tax growth and uh, other factors on the tax side, which are more real time, points to a labor market that softens significantly. And, and eventually it's hard for the U.S. consumer to do it single handedly. I asked Mike McKee whether the Fed was losing control. Jane, there's another question we should ask, too, whether they're seeing what they want to see because jobless claims, yes, are climbing. We're taking some heat out of the labour market. I think that's very, very unfortunate, and we all agree with that, because no-one wants to see job losses. They want to see job openings come down. They wanted to see inflation come down. Crude south of $90 a barrel 
on WTI. Jane, can you help me understand the distinction between the things that are developing at the moment that the Fed doesn't want to see and the Fed and the things that they're actually shooting for, the objective? Well, we've got to remember that uh, Labour, uh, I mean, rather, uh, monetary policy is an extremely blunt tool. And, and, and clearly, we all know that a lot of the inflation is, is supply-driven. Not all. There are a number of uh, uh, instances of, of strong demand, particularly in, in the U.S. And, and in fact, uh, there was a, a back-of-the-envelope calculation from the Federal Reserve in the middle of July produced to say that demand, uh, because of uh, fiscal spending during the pandemic, it reduced U.S. inflation by something like 2.5 percentage points, really quite significant and, and, and more than elsewhere. So we know that we've had excess demand. The Fed can't control the supply-side problems. It can control the demand. It's going to bring down demand. And, and yeah, OK, it would rather people remain in their jobs and job openings reduce. But the reality is, is that it can't fine-tune the economy like that the reality is is that it will make the labor market worse and that's part of the pass through of monetary policy to slow the economy to, to bring um, equilibrium in, in supply and demand down to a, a lower price level to bring inflation down so inevitably i think and, and purposely uh, the job market will loosen in the, in the coming months jane foley troy Gaisky, to the both of you thank you coming up on this program the morning calls and later from bernstein to goldman Sounded the alarm on the recent equity rally. How many banks are doing that right now? Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo is going to join us in about seven minutes' time. Looking forward to that. It's just around the corner. Live from New York, equity futures slightly negative, down a tenth of 1%. Good morning to you. That's the price action. Here are your morning calls. Cowan, downgrading coals. The market perform, expecting a weaker and inflationary backdrop to drive EPS downside. UBS upgrading Southern Company to buy, seeing fresh growth opportunities after winning approval for its long-awaited nuclear power plant. And finally, Bear downgrading Under Armour to neutral, $10 price target, highlighting a challenging macro environment and poor earnings visibility. Coming up next, we'll catch up with Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo and why he thinks that weakness in corporate earnings isn't going to come until next year. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Twenty-five seconds away from the opening bell in New York this Thursday morning. Good morning to you. Here's your price action. Slightly negative, down by 0.02 percent on the S&P. On the Nasdaq, totally unchanged after ripping almost 20 percent off the lows of the middle of June. What a rally we've seen on the Nasdaq 100. Let's your opening bell. Switch over the board and get to the bond market. All over the place. Yields lower now by not even a basis point to 270.28. Much higher at the front end. Curve inversion. Twos versus tens. On my screen, about negative 38 basis points at the moment. The euro showing some strength, euro dollar 101.84 and crude. Showing some weakness here, we're down more than one percentage point. It's a break of 90, 89.57 on WTI. About 15 seconds into this, let's get you some movers. Here's Abby. John, let's start out with one of the big winners yesterday. Today, not so much. Of course, I'm talking about Meta, and we heard yesterday about the possibility of a bond offering. Well, it's now a reality. This is the company's first ever bond offering. It will come in four parts, and it could be as much as $10 billion. And actually, now you have the stock flipping ever so slightly higher. Alibaba soaring, though, up 6.3%. Sales were better than feared, a big beat for the company relative to low expectations. This despite a contraction in the Chinese economy. To the downside, though, Eli Lilly down 1.5% percent off of its pre-market lows. They missed second quarter revenue estimates. They also slashed the fiscal year adjusted earnings forecast. Looks like it's a combination of macro headwinds and pricing. And then finally, you were just talking about oil below $90 a barrel, below important support. That's weighing on the energy complex. As you know, the worst sector on the day in Occidental Petroleum. One example of that, down eight tenths of one percent. Abby, thank you. About a minute and 15 seconds into this, almost totally unchanged on the S&P 500. Big Tech has been leading the rebound in equity markets over the last month, though. The Nasdaq 100, as I've said repeatedly, jumping about 19, 20 percent from its June lows. Taylor Riggs has more. Hey, Taylor. And John, John Authors, of course, our Bloomberg opinion columnist, says sort of maybe nicely that if you think about a bear market as a 20 percent decline, could a bull market be a 20 percent gain off of those lows? If so, using that loose definition, 
what a way we have come. As you mentioned, it's been all about big tech, the New York Fang Index, the Sox Index, the NASDAQ 100, really now up more from some of those sort of lows that we had mid-June, now 19, even 24% or so. A lot of this, as you've been mentioning, has to do with the yield story. We've been looking at a big rebound in the equity markets because in blue, it's been yields coming down. Of course, in the last few days, maybe a little bit of that narrative has changed, particularly on the front end. But in the last few weeks, it has really been a story of yields continuing to grow grind lower, helping to boost some of those long duration assets that is big tech. Finally, sort of on some of an individual mover level, we've been talking in the closing bell um, pins for one, PayPal, of course, given sort of the Elliott investments, but Tesla, Amazon as well, sort of some of the big movers in there. You're up 20, sometimes even 40% on some of the individual names that have been fueling sort of the big rebound that we've been seeing as of late. Unreal. We've absolutely ripped. Taylor, looking forward to the coverage at the close, as always. Taylor Riggs there. I've talked about a long list of strategists out in this rally. Max Kettner over at HSBC is one of them. This is what he's got to say. July's repricing higher of both risk on and risk off assets now leaves us with an unrealistic Goldilocks backdrop. We move to maximum underweight across equities, high yield and sovereigns and are tactically overweight cash. Kaylee has more. Hi, Kaylee. Hey, John. Well, they say all good things must come to an end, and a growing number of strategists, as you say, are saying that end is near for this equity market rally because, of course, Taylor was just running us through how far we've seen these stocks come off the lows, especially te uh, tech stocks. But what that has done is made them more expensive. When you look at historical P.E., we are still well above that 20-year average. And Bernstein, one of the shops that is really focused on the denominator of that, on the earnings story, saying basically we're still really early in this downgrade cycle. That echoes what we heard from Bank of America earlier this week, which said, yes, we have seen forward estimates coming down, but not enough considering they're still 6% above where they were when the equity market peaked back in January. And their data shows that in the last four recessions, the S&P only bottoms after EPS forecasts have fallen either to or below the level they were when the market peaked. So it's really pessimism about the forward view that is forming the bear case here because, of course, the backward looking view at the second quarter really hasn't been that bad. S&P earnings are up 9.7% year on year. Of course, a lot of that has to do with the outsized moves we have seen for profits for energy companies. But it's not just all about the earnings story either. You also have Goldman Sachs saying the path from here is likely to become more dependent on economic data. And without a clear positive shift in macro momentum, stocks could see another leg lower, John. Kelly, thank you. Chris Harvey of Wells Fargo has a message to the bears. You're too early. This is what he's got to say. We do not expect to retest the lows until the first half of 23. Fed expectations toggling down the lower cost of capital and second quarter earnings clarity has raised the equity market floor. First half of 23 may be tough for stocks. He goes on to say we may see operating margins collapse and exhausting consumer and the job pitch are turning for certain. Chris, I'm pleased to say, joins us right now. Chris, let's start there, buddy. And it's great to catch up with you, sir. Why do you think the bears are too early? Well, again, it's exactly what we said. Right, your cost of capital is down. We're through earnings. Earnings, e even for us, as we look at margins, we expected margins to, to not be as strong as they were. And, and strong is the wrong word. We expected more compression. You didn't get it. But more importantly, the thing that we always talked about, the thing that we hung our hat on, it wasn't about a valuation. It wasn't about a level. It was about the Fed. And when the Fed was going to toggle things down, what we said and what we believe is, equity market can sustain gains and equity market prices can go higher. And that's what we're seeing. And the last thing you, you touched on and a few of the commentators touched on it, we are now in a growth market. Rates are coming down. That's really positive for growth and for the market in general because we are the S&P is a long duration asset. Chris, can that continue to work with inflation close to 9 percent? All right, John. So let, let's talk about break evens. Let's talk about sure. inflation and, and let's talk about what's happened over the last year. A year ago, we said this very loudly on, on the show a number of times. Last year at this point in time, I had never seen a pricing environment the way I had seen it last year. Everyone was raising prices, and the consumer was just price unconscious. Now we're seeing a consumer that is no longer price unconscious. They are making decisions, and, and they are changing their behavior. More so, if we look at break-evens, break-evens from right across maturities have come down and come down significantly. So the market's saying that cyclical component to inflation is coming down. If we look at some of the components in I ISM recently, they've come off the boil. What we haven't seen is we haven't seen CPI. Uh, CPI is still running hot. We'll see. We get CPI a little less than a week from now. But ultimately, what we're seeing is we're seeing inflation come down, and we should expect inflation to come down. It will be sticky. 
there are geopolitical reasons why it won't get to levels that we've seen in the past. But ultimately, we're late in the cycle. The economy is slowing. Um, demand is slowing down. And the consumer's behavior is changing. So again, expect to see inflation come down. It, it'll be a little bit tricky with CPI. We'll see what happens. But ultimately, all the factors you need to see are, are occurring. And so we're, we're in a much different camp with inflation today than we were a year ago. Chris, help me out with the timing of this. And as you know better than most, the timing of anything is the most difficult part of the call. When do I start to transition away from what's working now towards what you're anticipating in the first half of next year? Yeah. So, so John, what we said at the beginning of the year, we thought the first half of 2022 was going to be about um, defensives and cyclicality, reopening. In June, and, but we also said by the second half of this year, we're going to go into a growth market. We're in that growth market. In June, we downgraded cyclicality. And what we're telling clients is you really need to rinse the portfolio from cyclicality. What we're seeing on the value side is we're seeing what I consider a lot of value traps. Companies trading at mid-single-digit earnings. Okay, whenever, whenever I've seen this that late in the cycle, what that is is the market telling us those earnings that you see today are not going to exist in 6, 12, 18 months. You're going to get multiple expansion, but not the kind you like. So I think we're in a growth market. I think we'll stay in a growth market, but you also have to manage your risk. And, and there are parts of the low volume defensive sector that, that we do like, and you want to barbell growth with, with something, either better balance sheets or, or a little less volatility. Chris, I don't know what to do with discretionary. Can you tell me what to do with discretionary? I hear everybody <laughs> talking about a bear market, a recession, and there we are ripping 25% off the June lows. And Chris, I just scratched my head at that. What are we doing? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a good question because we're, we're looking at that right now. We've been underweight retail for some time. Uh, that's worked very well, but you are seeing a bounce. And we just looked at uh, the performance of staples versus discretionary. And staples obviously have ripped over the last six, 12 months versus discretionary. Right? And what we're seeing, getting back to margins, what we're seeing on the staple side, that's the area where we're seeing real margin pressure, right? And, and staples, excuse me, excuse me, discretionary, looks like maybe it's in the bottoming process, maybe it beat the rush. So it, it's worth a look. We're not sure just yet, but we're going to do a lot more work in this space because prices have really turned and, and multiples in some cases are trading at recessionary levels. Someone's doing more than looking. They're buying and buying tons <laughs> of it, apparently. Chris, it's good to catch up. You're going to stick with us, I know. We're going to talk about some layoffs potentially in corporate America. Consumer discretionary right now up another third of 1%, leading the gains this morning. The S&P down by a little more than a tenth of 1% on the downside, as you might expect. It's energy down 2%, given the moves we're seeing in crude. When was the last time we talked about the 80s on WTI? We can do that right now. $89 a barrel on WTI and down 1.4% on the session. Coming up, investors gearing up for payrolls as corporate America continues shrinking its workforce. Even though the economy is slowing down, we still have a really tight labor market and there's still more jobs out there than workers. Walmart's the latest. That conversation up next. the economy slowing down, we still have a really tight labor market and there's still more jobs out there than workers. So I think it is possible to cool the labor market and cool the economy without seeing a real large increase in unemployment. There is a way to kind of thread that needle, even if we have a bit of a mild recession. Investors gearing up for job stay in America. This is a growing list of companies continues hitting the brakes on hiring. Beyond me, following Walmart, the CEO writing the following. While difficult, this decision is one piece of our larger strategy to reduce operating expenses and support sustainable growth. Taylor Riggs has more. Hey, Taylor. And John, like you said, just in the last 24 hours, a few companies, Walmart, of course, after the bill yesterday, saying a reduction of about 200 employees. But again, for the largest private employer, that may not be a huge deal, except that when you start to add up sort of everyone else, right, and you just sort of think about the difference in Robinhood, for example, cutting to 23 percent of their workforce and the shift that we've seen from slowing growth of hiring to freezes to then maybe laying people off. And that is where sort of we really start to look at this labor market. Maybe one 
one reason, and Mike McKee, of course, would nail this more than I would, is sort of the employment cost index as we track how maybe expensive through some of the direct and the indirect costs some of these employees are. It's near sort of a record since we started tracking this data going back since 2001. The training, the taxes, Social Security contributions, sort of you name it, and that could be maybe one of the reasons behind it. Really interesting, though, if you take a look at this terminal chart, while companies, they've been paying more, of course, for these employees, hasn't been keeping up with sales. When we think about sales per employee, uh, it's maybe a look at some of the productivity and sort of rebounding, of course, from a trough when it was up uh, now against about 30% from that day, Jan John. So that can sort of attract sort of where we are with this labor market. Taylor Riggs, thank you. Going into payrolls tomorrow, looking for something close to 250,000. Mike, you know this story. We're all asking the same question. We've seen some weak data points. Will we see one tomorrow? Well, we don't know because the numbers that uh, people use to try to figure it out have given us mixed signals. We just got claims this morning and jobless claims are up by another 6,000. That's been a regular thing, but take a look at the box in the corner there. Continuing claims rising, but not nearly as much, which suggests that people who are losing jobs are still rapidly getting new ones. And as long as that's the case, then maybe we don't see a huge change. The forecast for tomorrow, you've had this up a couple times, 250,000. That is a slowdown from where we have been, but it isn't significantly so. It's much higher than average over the five years before the pandemic and no change expected in the unemployment rate. So it doesn't look really bad. Uh, and also the one thing I got to point out here is that jobs are not a great recession indicator. By the time we get to a contraction in jobs, we're already in recession. You can see that clearly in the chart and nobody predicts a uh, co uh, contraction in jobs before it happens. So uh, it, it's hard to say that this is going to be a huge leading indicator, but it will tell us something about the health of the economy overall. And then the Fed takes some comfort in the fact that jobs are still strong. Mike, do you want to do the academic debate of the moment, <laughs> essentially on job openings and whether you can reduce job openings yeah. from the level they're at without unemployment rising? Olivier Blanchard, Larry Summers going at it with Governor Waller over the last week. Yeah, uh, Summers and Blanchard say you uh, can't. You, unemployment's got to go up as the job vacancies come down, and Waller says that's not necessarily true. And so far, Waller's winning in the sense that we got the latest JOLTS report, and it showed vacancies going down without unemployment going up. But we'll see after tomorrow. This is going to be a debate that will go on for a while, John, and we won't know who's right for some time. I can't say it's an exciting debate, that's for sure. Mike, but it certainly matters. You're not an economist. I mean, economists, this exactly. is, this they're, is they're what qualifies it. as exciting. They're loving it. This <laughs> is exciting for economists, I know. Mike McKee, good to catch up, buddy. Looking forward to Mike's coverage tomorrow. Payroll's just around the corner. Chris Harvey with us now. Chris, how will you navigate that tomorrow, the labour market report and the incoming data through next week to the CPI report on the horizon? Yeah, yeah John, as far as the job picture, uh, we think Mike had it right. It's not a leading indicator. It, it's a coincidental to a lagging indicator. And one of the things that we've seen is, is things are directionally not good. And, and there's a couple of anecdotes. Six months ago, we had a tech headhunter in, and he was saying, hey, you can go into your boss's office, you don't need another job, and you can get a 20% raise. We had him in a couple of weeks ago, he said, you go into your boss's office now and ask for a 20% raise, you're gonna get fired, right? <laughs> and and you're, you're beginning to see these things happen. What, what I think is by September, you're not gonna to have to talk to people about return to office because they wanna get more face time with the boss. Things are beginning to get tight. We are late in the cycle. We can argue about whether we're going to recession or not. I think we are, but it's late in the cycle and you should start to see a degradation in the job market. CPI, what I think is it's just tricky, right? So what CPI can do, if it comes in hot, right? Then what you would expect to see is the market, equity market to get roiled. Fed fund expectations to go up for a short period of time. I don't think long because I don't think it's lasting because other indicators are telling you that things are coming off the boil. But I think CPI is more impactful in the short term to the markets. And if you get a hot um, number, equity markets will pull back for a period of time. If you get something that comes in much lighter, this rally that we're seeing, will we think it will continue. Chris, can I pick up on something you just said? How people yeah. will respond to upcoming weakness. Is there a suggestion within that that you might get a supply side response in the labor market as you start to get a deceleration in economic growth? I, I think so. I, I think, you know, one of the things that, that's also happened is you had problems with, and we looked at the different pockets of the labor force, 
right? And prime age women were, it was an area that was lagging. And part of that was related to some of the COVID issues, complications with COVID issues, childcare issues, so on and so forth. That's improved. But what we're seeing for the most part is people are coming back into the labor force. And we think they'll continue to slowly be dragged back into the labor force. Not in leaps and bounds, but, but kind of in this grind going forward. And, and you're right. That's something else that we're really not talking about. And that's something else that can weigh on the job picture. Interesting. That's payrolls. Let's finish on CPI. CPI, very close to 9%. Still, if we get a reduction next week on headline, core could be sticky. Chris, it's back to growth. I know from what you've described, at least it sounds like to me that you're looking for that pre-pandemic playbook that worked so well. The Nasdaq ripping, big tech doing its thing. Chris, where does inflation and what you need to see fit into that call over the next couple yeah. of months? So, so, John, something we've touched on in a not too distant past is we talked about 10 year break evens. And we said if 10 year break evens get in this 250 to 275 percent range, we think that's pretty good for your growth stocks. It's now about it's slightly below 250. It's actually been in a range lower than we would have expected in this kind of 225 to 250 range. As long as it's in this you know, sub 275 level, we think this is very good for growth because what the bond market is telling you, what the 10-year in particular is telling you is we're going to stagflation. You have reals pretty much close to zero, plus maybe 25 basis points, and you have break-evens at, at 250. That's an inflationary environment with not a whole lot of growth. By definition, that's stagflation, and that's good for your growth and your growth stocks. Where does energy fit in, Chris? Just a final one from me. Winner of the year. Yeah, so... Losing more recently. So I, your thoughts? So I, I think energy... You know, energy is a place we're gonna, going to want to come back to probably in another three or six months. It just fits into that cyclical trade that we don't like at this point in time. But a lot of the policy is going to keep supply pretty tight. And what we've seen from the, the energy companies is they're doing a really good job at restructuring their balance sheets, at, at operating on profitability, not growth. And ultimately, there's a lot more quality. There's a lot more value in the space. We just think it's a, we think it's a little too early for that bounce to occur. And so probably another three, six months is where we get much more interested. Chris, awesome to catch up. A different perspective when there's so much gloom out there at the moment. Chris Harvey there of Wells Fargo saying you'll see the pain eventually, but ultimately you've got to wait. It's the first half of 2023 where things start to change in a more material way from him and a team, at least. That's their view. Equities unchanged on the S&P. The Nasdaq's still doing its thing, up about a third of 1%. Maybe we should consider, and I've raised this a couple of times over the last week, that Marko Kalanovic over at JP Morgan might be right now. He's having his time in the sun. He said this earlier this week, whether it's earnings or the Fed, we see a reset of investor expectations. Risk markets are rallying despite some disappointing data releases indicating bad news was already anticipated priced in. He's been looking for a big recovery in stocks. We've had one off the lows, that's for sure. BNP Paribas said something that stuck with me all week on crowding in. With the Fed laying the foundation for a more moderate approach in the back half of the year alongside resilient earnings, we see scope for further upside in the near term as market participants get crowded in. That was BNP. And then Max Kettner this morning of HSBC joining the rest of them basically just saying wishful thinking. I think that was the title of the note from him and the team at HSBC. Wishful thinking. You get to pick your side. Right now, we're basically unchanged on the S&P. Coming up, the market moving events you need to be watching. Your trading diary just around the corner. Five minutes into the session. So far, so good. No real drama here. Unchanged on the S&P, on the Nasdaq, just about positive, up a tenth of 1%. That's the price action. Here's your trading diary. President Biden hosting a roundtable with business leaders on inflation at 1.45 Eastern time. Fed President Mester speaking later today with Barkin on deck for Friday. And we round out the week tomorrow with the main event. It's the payrolls report just around the corner. We're looking for 250K. That's the median estimate. The highest 325, the lowest 50. It's a widespread once again. Tune in right here on Bloomberg TV, all-star lineup: Mohammed Al Arian, Pimco's former Pimco's Mohammed Al Arian, BlackRock's Rick Reader. We'll be catching up, of course, with Mike Collins and Anastasia Amoroso as well from New York City. This was the countdown to the open. This is Bloomberg.